If you were chosen for a battle royale where you had to fight to the death in front of a live television audience, what would you do? After a failed rebellion against the tyrannical government, the 12 districts are forced to send 24 children into the Hunger Games as punishment. But when the future president of Pan Am forms an unlikely alliance with one of the tributes, they put on a show that's going to change the world forever. We're here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to survive the death game in the Hunger Games. The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. <laughs> This kid is going to do whatever it takes to come out on top. It's the dark days of the First Rebellion, three years before the start of the Hunger Games, and the constant struggle between the capital and the original 13 districts has left even the wealthiest families in Penam struggling for their very survival. After returning home from a scavenging run that nearly cost them their lives, the future president Coriolanus Snow and his cousin Tigris find out that the boy's father, a well-respected general, was killed in a rebel ambush, leading the family to fall on even harder times. Years later, we find Snow here getting ready in his family's rundown mansion. He's determined to win a scholarship that would return his family to their former status, but his professor, Dean Highbottom, the original creator of The Hunger Games, is the only person standing in his way. Down at the academy, Snow meets with his stuck-up classmates. They're all just about as evil as it gets, except for one, his friend Seginus, whose wealthy father is actually the one funding the scholarship but he opposes the games for their cruelty. After taking their seats, Seginus quietly lets his friends know that there won't be any scholarship given out because the Dean has decided to change the rules. It's the day of the reaping where two children from each of the districts are chosen to fight to the death in the capital arena as punishment for their rebellion. But there's a twist. The citizens of the capital are starting to lose interest in the games. So this year, each of the academy's 24 top students will be assigned to one of the tributes as their mentor, with the scholarship going to whoever's tribute puts on the best show. And it doesn't matter whether they actually survive until the end. The ceremony begins with the Dean deliberately assigning Snow one of the worst tributes, a girl from District 12 named Lucy Gray, but that was his biggest mistake. As the girl takes the stage, she suddenly breaks out into a song before telling the whole country to kiss her ass, putting on a show that gets the attention of everyone watching. It's like nothing that they've ever seen, and Snow here suddenly realizes that he just might have an unexpected star on his hands. But hey, I'm gonna throw it over to Josh real quick to talk about something real important. You know me. I'm all about real talk. Let's be honest, guys. A little thinning on top happens to all of us. I first noticed it myself a few years ago. And let me tell you, it wasn't exactly confidence boosting. I tried all sorts of things, but nothing really worked. That's when I heard about Keeps. Keeps is this game changer online service that makes getting treatment for hair loss super easy and affordable. You do everything from the comfort of your own home. Plus, their treatments are clinically proven to work, like 90% effective against hair loss and growing back up to 35% more hair. Whether you're dealing with the early stages or just want things to slow down, Keeps has options for you. They even have the FDA approved hair loss treatment options, as well as a two-in-one gel that combines both treatments for convenience. And it's not just about the meds, friends. Keeps also has these amazing hair thickening shampoo, conditioner, and styling pomade that make the hair you have look and feel thicker. It's the whole package, and it actually works. Most guys see results within six months, which is pretty freaking cool, right? Look, I get it. Hair loss can be a sensitive topic. But here's the thing. You're not alone. Nearly a million men have chosen Keeps to keep their hair. And the reviews are off the charts. We're talking about over 4,500 five-star reviews with real before and after pics that will blow your mind. Hair loss stops with Keeps. For a special offer to get started, go to keeps.com slash how to be or click the link in the description. They've got a special offer just for our followers that you don't want to miss. Trust me, dudes. Hair loss stops with Keeps. Let's keep growing. All right, now back to Ben. Okay, somebody needs to tell Lucy Gray here that this is the Hunger Games, not Pan Am's Got Talent. 
All joking aside, this girl just put on one hell of a show, and she doesn't realize it yet, but this might just save her life. Her mentor Snow here knows that this year, the tribute who gets the most attention is going to receive the most donations from the viewers, giving them a major advantage over the rest of the competition. The event might be called the Hunger Games, but there's nothing really playful about being locked in an arena with 23 other people who are trying to kill you by any means necessary. Snow badly needs the money that he'll win if his tribute puts on the best show, and Lucy Gray, of course, needs as many advantages as she can get just to survive against her bigger and stronger opponents. So although they're not exactly on the same side, the most important thing for both of them is going to be to come up with a strategy to win over as many many viewers as possible. They're already off to a good start, but if it were me, I'd look for inspiration from two of the biggest popularity contests that are already part of our daily lives, whether we like it or not. Politics and reality TV. It's no secret that a large part of winning any political contest comes down to getting your name in the news more often than your opponents. And what people are even saying about you doesn't even need to be positive to have a positive effect on your numbers. Ideally, you'd want people to choose their leaders based on who they think is the most qualified, but many people would argue that this isn't how we actually make our decisions. No offense to Lucy Gray here, but taking one look at her makes it pretty clear that she's not exactly the most naturally talented fighter in the group. What she can do is win them over by making herself the most reliable. To do this, she'll need to take any opportunity that she has to engage with the audience, whether that's on camera or even on a personal basis in between events. With viewership on the decline, it seems like even the citizens of the capital are getting tired of the bloodshed. But if she can remind them that she's a person with similar hopes and aspirations, and not just another anonymous human sacrifice. She might win over support not just from the districts, but from the big spenders in the capital as well. Getting people invested in your personality is a great place to start, but the truth is that shaking hands and kissing babies can only take you so far. If you really want to get an audience's attention, then look no further than reality television to show you exactly what you need, a bit of romance and a lot of drama. Later, Snow and Lucy Gray here are going to quickly develop feelings for each other, and they should make it part of their strategy to lean into this as much as possible. After all, what better way is there to get people interested than a will-they-won't-they they relationship between a rich pretty boy from the capital and a resourceful tribute girl from the districts? It's like Romeo and Juliet with a touch of gladiatorial combat. The romantic tension practically writes itself. At the same time, she should also try to earn the trust of some of the weaker tributes before the game starts. That way, she'll have some handy meat shields that she can rely on in a pinch. And if all else fails, then there's one last forbidden strategy that she could try to get some attention, and for that, we'll turn to the world of American professional wrestling. When you think of legends like Nature Boy Ric Flair, Triple Eight, Rowdy Roddy Piper, and Stone Cold Steve Austin, what's the biggest thing that they all have in common? Each of them reached their superstar status by leaning into their controversial, yet impossible to ignore persona. Lucy Gray could talk smack about the other tributes, make herself come off as arrogant, and even find ways to sabotage the others outside of the arena before the game even begins. It's not going to make her any allies among the tributes, but it will definitely get the people's attention, and they'll want her to stick around for as long as possible, if only just to see what sort of underhanded tactics that she's going to come up with next. We can't all be John Cena after all, somebody has to be The Rock. And if it gets her more donations, then there's no reason why Lucy Gray wouldn't want to consider playing the villain. Besides building an audience, it's also important that Lucy Gray actually makes it out alive. To better her chances of survival, I'd suggest looking at past winners from the previous nine games and carefully studying their strategies to see how they managed to come out on top. And it's obviously much better to go in with some sort of time-tested plan than to just wing it on a hope and a prayer. It won't be easy, but with the right combination of strategy and popular support, both Lucy Gray and Snow here just might be able to win it all in the end. Back at the house, Tigris explains that the best way to get Lucy Gray to trust him is for Snow to convince her that they have something in common. 
which gives him an idea. The next day, Snow heads down to the train station as the tributes are arriving, and offers Lucy Gray a rose, introducing himself as her mentor for the games. Taking advantage of a moment where the guards are distracted, he quickly sneaks onto the transport truck alongside Lucy Gray and the other tributes. When they realize that he's from the capital, the others immediately consider killing him. But Lucy Gray here manages to distract them until they're all suddenly dumped into a cage at the zoo. Taking her hand, the two approach the bars and introduce themselves to the reporters, until Snow is taken away by a team of peacekeepers. But he's beginning to earn the girls' trust. Back at the academy, the dean wants to disqualify Snow from the competition for breaking the rules. But when the head game maker, Dr. Gall, shows up, she has a different idea. She's so impressed with his performance at the zoo that she wants to hear his suggestions for how to make the games more interesting. Snow suggests that they can increase viewership by getting the audience personally invested in the human side of the tributes so that they'll have someone to root for. And the game maker likes this so much that she asks him to write up a proposal for the next day. Later, Snow returns to the zoo to give Lucy Gray and her friend a few slices of bread. Just then, their conversation is suddenly cut short when one of the tributes reaches through the bars and slashes his classmate's neck with a broken glass bottle before being shot down by the guards. Upset, Snow blames himself for what happened, saying that it was his idea for the mentors to get closer to their tributes, and his grandmother thinks that outbursts like this are the sign of another rebellion on the rise. The next morning, Snow and his class partner Clemencia are summoned to the head game maker's laboratory to discuss their proposed ideas. Although Snow did all of the work, Clemencia here immediately starts claiming that it was actually her, but the game maker has a deadly way of finding out who's telling the truth. She leads them both to a giant cage full of thousands of venomous snakes, with the pages of their proposal buried inside. It turns out that the snakes are perfectly harmless as long as they recognize your scent. This means that whoever wrote the pages should be able to safely grab them out, and the game maker challenges Clemencia to go first. With no other choice, she reaches in to grab a page, but is immediately bitten by one of the snakes, falling off the platform to the floor below. Now that she has her proof, the guards drag Clemencia away, and even the game maker doesn't know if she's going to live or die. She says that she liked Snow's ideas so much that she's going to have her team implement as many as possible and sends him off to prepare Lucy Gray for the final interview. Okay, talk about biting off more than you can chew. When Clemencia here decided to snake Snow for the credit, pun fully intended by the way, I don't think that she expected to be hit with a pop quiz that looks more like it belongs on an episode of Fear Factor. It looks like lying came back to bite her literally and I all think that we know what I'm about to say. Clemencia, you f up. I think this is what we all secretly wish would happen to that one kid in the class who never chips in for the group project, but then wants to take just as much credit for it as everyone else. From the very beginning, it should have been obvious to Clem here that the game maker knew all along that she had absolutely nothing to do with it. Snow was even going to try and make it seem like they actually did work on it together just to be a nice guy until she cut him off and threw him under the bus. Seriously, who walks into a lab that looks like this and thinks that they can pull the wool over this lady's eyes? Clem's lucky that she didn't put her into one of those jars, and she escaped with only a snake bite that she might actually survive. She could have just admitted that she lied to get ahead, and maybe the game maker would have respected her cutthroat approach. But she tried to stick to her own made-up story even in the face of painful death and ended up paying the price. Congratulations, Clem. You f***ed up. Now it's important to point out that one of the first things that she noticed about these snakes, besides the fact that there were thousands of them, was their incredibly bright range of colors. Clem asked the doctor if there was any point to this, and indeed there is. It's to warn you to stay far, far away. It's called aposmatism, and it's a defense mechanism where animals like these snakes here evolve to have distinctive color patterns that make it clear that they're not to be messed with. 
In many snake species like the Indonesian pit viper, boom slang, and eyelash viper, these bright colors serve as a natural warning sign of their highly venomous bite. So unless you want to find out what it feels like to have hemotoxic venom injected into your bloodstream by two five millimeter long fangs faster than you can blink, it's probably not a good idea to get too close. Her only hope to get through this unharmed would have been to move as slowly and calmly as possible, which is obviously easier said than done when you're reaching into a giant container full of deadly spaghetti. The good news is that not all venomous snake bites are fatal. It's going to leave a mark, but Clem here just might survive if she can keep her heart rate down, drink lots of water, hold the wound below heart level to slow the spread of the venom through her bloodstream, and of course, get some immediate medical attention. With that being said, there is one other strategy that she might have used if she was as smart as she claimed to be. We know that these particular snakes were specifically bred by the doctor. They have poor eyesight and hearing, but an exceptional sense of smell and won't bite someone whose scent they recognize. Knowing this, she could have taken her jacket off and put it into the container first. That way, the snakes would get to know her smell before she reached inside. It might take some time before you're safe to reach in there, but simply doing so might show that you're creative enough to come up with survival plans on the fly and win over the approval of the game maker here. We'll see these snakes again soon enough though, but luckily, Snow here isn't going to forget this one important lesson because it's going to save someone's life. The Tributes and their mentors are taken to the Capitol Arena, where they're all given 15 minutes to check the place out and come up with a battle plan. A few of them start to make alliances, but Lucy Gray and some of the weaker competitors are left on their own. Suddenly, the building is rocked by dozens of huge explosions, knocking everyone to the floor and killing several of them in the blast. It's an act of sabotage by the district rebels, and before he can get to safety, Snow here is trapped under a chunk of the collapsed roof. A few of the tributes take advantage of the confusion to make their escape. Instead of running, Lucy Gray stops to help rescue Snow and is dragged away by the guards just as she lifts the burning rubble off of his back. Okay, Lucy Gray just saved Snow's life, but something else happened here that we should point out because it might be an early warning sign that Snow isn't as invested in protecting her as he claims to be. Think of any explosion scene that you can remember where the hero wants to protect someone that they care about. What do they immediately do? Their protective instincts naturally kick in and they cover the other person with their body to shield them from the falling debris. Because deep down, they're willing to sacrifice themselves to save their friend. For an instant, Snow here almost looked like he was going to do it, but then he had second thoughts about leaving Lucy Gray to fend for herself. Then, once he was trapped under the rubble, instead of telling Lucy Gray to get out of there and save herself, he actually yelled for her to come back and help him, even though this could have gotten her killed. Now, it's a good thing that Lucy Gray here actually is that kind of heroic, because stopping to help Snow ended up saving her life too, since she would have probably been shot by the peacekeepers for trying to escape. But ladies, take notes. If your man won't shield you from a collapsing building, then it's time to get back in the dating pool. Although it's only a small detail, it shows how Snow really puts himself first above all else. And picking up on this now just might help Lucy Gray here avoid some trouble down the road, but we can only wait and see. Sometime later, Snow wakes up in the hospital with Tigris and Sejanus watching over him. On the TV, he sees Lucy Gray at the final press conference before the games singing a song about a lost love that brings everyone who watches it to tears and causes a massive increase in viewer donations. She's caught the attention of the world once again, but tomorrow she'll have to fight for her life and no one is coming to save her. That night, Snow returns to the arena where he notices a hole in the floor that leads down into a system of underground tunnels where Lucy Gray might be able to hide. Back at home, he empties a bunch of rat poison into a small folding mirror, and he's going to give it to Lucy Gray as a secret weapon. Returning to the zoo, Snow gives her the poison and tells her about the hole in the ground. He encourages her to ignore the weapons and run straight for the tunnels when the game starts, promising that he's going to find a way to get her out of there as a thank you for saving his life. In the morning, it's time for the death match to begin. The tributes are forced into their places in the arena while the mentors tune in live from the studio. That's when they realize that the peacekeepers caught the escapee Marcus, and they've tied him up by the wrists to a concrete pillar so that he'll be killed without ever getting a chance to defend himself.
well. The starting bell rings, and the competing tributes spring into action, with the most aggressive of them sprinting straight for the weapons in the center, and the others just trying to run for their lives. Okay, now things are officially getting good. This is going to be the most high pressure situation of any of their lives without a doubt. The only way to survive here is to think strategically and make the smartest decisions that you can early on. Once that bell rings, you have to make a critical choice. Either go straight for the weapon in the center or try to get to safety and find somewhere to hide. Lucy Gray here made the worst decision possible by only running halfway towards the middle and then hesitating, which makes her an easy target for everyone else out there. The first few moments here are going to be total chaos, so the critical thing is to focus on staying alive rather than getting early kills. After all, it's not your kill count that actually matters, only who's still left standing in the end. Personally, I would have taken Snow's advice and gone straight for the tunnels because this comes with a number of advantages. Most importantly, it limits the angles of approach. You see, up in the arena, tributes can come at you from any direction, but down in the tunnels, they can only be ahead or behind you. Getting down there first would also give her an opportunity to set a trap and get an early kill. If she couldn't make it in time, then sticking near the outer walls or getting to the high ground up in the stands is the next best bet. Now, the real weapons may be in the center, but there's plenty of debris from the bombing that she could use as an improvised weapon in a pinch. On my way to the tunnel, I'd grab a heavy or sharp object, and then once I got inside, quickly hide out somewhere near the tunnel entrance. The odds are good that someone is going to follow you down there, so this would give you a chance to get the jump on them. Scoring an easy kill and getting you their weapon as an added bonus. Her colorful dress is her signature look, but I'd take some time to roll around in the mud and scum down there since it would help me to blend in with the environment and not stick out so badly. Then it's time to lurk down there like a mole person and kill anyone who wanders into your domain. As someone who's used to living off of the land, she has a natural leg up when it comes to finding creative sources of food and water, which will dramatically extend her long-term survivability. Being hungry or dehydrated makes you an easier target. If Lucy Gray can keep herself alive and choose her fights wisely, then she can bide her time until the strongest fighters take each other out and give her the best odds of actually making it out of this arena while still in one piece. A few of the other tributes rush towards Lucy Gray with their melee weapons, but she dodges around the arena as they start taking each other out one after another. Finally, she spots Jessup wandering around confused on the other side of the battlefield and races towards him across the pile of rubble in the center. It's an absolute bloodbath, but Lucy Gray and Jessup manage to slip into the tunnels just in time, with another pair of tributes chasing after them. They make it to a locked metal door, but manage to crawl to safety through a small access point in the bottom. One of the tributes that's chasing them tries getting through, but another group of contestants show up and kill them both. Things die down for a while as the survivors regroup, but that's when the game maker comes to see Snow with a problem. It turns out that his friend Sejanus was classmates with Marcus when he lived in the districts and somehow snuck into the arena to pay his final respects. She's going to cut the feed for an hour and force Snow to get his friend out of there before it's too late. Sejanus initially refuses to leave, but they're forced to run when Coral and her friends start trying to kill them. In the chaos, Snow ends up killing one of the tributes with a metal club, and the two of them escape just in time, with Coral promising to go after Lucy Gray now instead. Okay, that was close. Snow here clearly just wanted to get his friend and get the hell out, but there might have been a way that he could have used this opportunity to both he and Lucy Gray's advantage. As soon as he walked into the arena, he should have grabbed a weapon off of one of the dead tributes, not only as a way to defend himself and Sejanus, but to tip the scales in Lucy Gray's favor as well. He knows that he has a whole hour while the cameras are off, which means that he could use this time to take out a few more tributes, which would give Lucy Gray less to worry about, specifically the toughest ones like Coral and Reaper. They're not expecting anyone else to come into the arena, so if he kept a low profile, he'd be able to maintain the element of surprise and possibly catch them while their guard was down. 
Plus, none of the viewers need to know that he was secretly thinning out the competition, and this would increase both of their chances of getting what they want, so it's a win-win. Of course, it would have been incredibly dangerous, but if he really wants to win and cares about Lucy Gray, it's an opportunity that he just can't pass up. Meanwhile, back in the tunnels, Jessup begins foaming at the mouth and acting incredibly strange. Watching from the studio, Snow realizes that the kid is finally succumbing to a rabies infection that he picked up after being bitten by a bat on the train. Thinking quickly, he convinces Jessup's mentor to use her donations to send in a drone with a bottle of water, knowing that the rabies will make him hydrophobic. Sure enough, Jessup loses his balance and breaks his back on the rubble below. Now, her only other friend is dead. Lucy Gray is immediately surrounded by the pack, but Snow calls in another swarm of water delivery drones that create enough of a distraction for her to slip away. They quickly start going after Lamina instead, and although she puts up a good fight, she's eventually overpowered and stabbed in the chest by Coral. While they're distracted, Lucy Gray pours rat poison into a bottle of water before quickly dumping out all the rest, leaving only the poisoned bottle as a trap. Coral returns to finish the job, but she narrowly escapes into one of the vents where the girl isn't able to get to her. From her hiding spot, Lucy Gray watches as the members of the pack begin fighting over the last bottle of water, and Coral even kills one of her own teammates when he tries to challenge her for it. She's about to take a sip from it herself, but gets distracted when they notice this younger girl, Wovie, hiding out in the rubble, and they decide to chase her into another part of the arena. Just then, this sick kid, Ill Dill, starts going for the bottle instead, and there's nothing that Lucy Gray can do to stop her. All that she can do is watch as Dill grabs the bottle and takes a drink before immediately dying from the poison inside. Okay, Lucy Gray's doing great just to have survived this far, but she might have just made an important mistake here. From the white color of the rat poison, we can guess that it's a specific type of extremely potent neurotoxin called Tex. This poison is actually so lethal that it's been banned worldwide since the 1980s because it's a hundred times more toxic than potassium cyanide. Just seven milligrams of this substance is enough to kill a full grown adult, which means that it should take even less to kill one of these tributes. Instead of dumping out the other bottles, Lucy Gray should have tried to spread the love a bit and put a small out of the poison into as many of them as possible. That way, it wouldn't be such an obvious trap and could end up killing more than just one opponent, which would be a huge help since in the end, only one person gets to live. As an added bonus, once they started to figure out what's going on, the survivors would become too afraid to drink any of the water that they found, making them dehydrated and therefore easier to take out. Oh yeah, I mean, it's a dirty tactic, but she needs to do whatever it takes if she's going to survive. Suddenly, the broadcast is interrupted by an urgent announcement from the game maker. The president's son has died from his injuries after being wounded in the rebel bombing, and she's going to take it out on the tributes, even if it means that there's no one left alive to win. She's going to release her snakes into the arena to kill everyone inside, but Snow quickly sneaks into her lab and slips a handkerchief with Lucy Gray's scent onto it into their cage to protect her. Meanwhile, Coral and her pack start going after Lucy Gray again up in the vents. Realizing that she's right above them, she takes more of the poison and dumps it onto this kid, Treach, who starts to get sick just as Coral begins stabbing up at her through the ceiling. The roof collapses, knocking Coral to the ground and forcing Lucy Gray to run for her life. But that's when a massive drone flies in and releases the snakes. Wovi, Mizen, Reaper, and even Coral are killed as thousands of snakes flood into the arena. It looks like she's done for, but Lucy Gray knows just what to do at a time like this. Break out into an inspirational song. As the snakes crawl all over her without biting, the viewers start chanting for the game maker to let her out, and she's finally forced to give in. Lucy Gray and Snow have won, but this is no time to get excited because the Dean found the handkerchief and mirror that he knows belonged to Snow's parents. He's been caught cheating, and as punishment, he's going to be sent to the districts to serve 20 years among the peacekeepers. As he's receiving his assignment, Snow bribes his way into being sent to District 12. 
On the train, he's shocked to find that Sejanus has also volunteered to go with him, and he thinks that out in the districts they might actually have a chance to make a positive change. One night, while Snow and his squad are on leave for the weekend, they decide to go down to a local bar, and who else takes the stage but Lucy Gray herself? The next day, Snow finds Lucy Gray sitting alone out in the countryside. They are suddenly interrupted by a group of peacekeepers there to investigate the fight, forcing Snow to hide, but she tells him to meet her there again tomorrow, and she'll show him a secret spot in the woods where they don't have to worry about being caught. When he arrives back at the peacekeeper base, Snow receives some unexpected news. His commander has taken notice of his excellent test scores and training records, and has decided to fast track him to officer training school. He's going to be reassigned to District 2 to begin training in just 10 days, and if everything goes well, then he might have a shot at getting back to the capital one day. Snow hesitates at first, but the commander reminds him that this is an order, not an option leaving him with no choice but to agree. Snow's able to call Tigris for the first time to give her the good news, but finds out that she and their grandma were evicted from their family home. Heartbroken, he promises her that he'll be home soon to set things right. Later that day, Snow confronts Sejanus after he catches him trying to help the prisoners. He's worried that they'll both be executed if their superiors find out what he's up to, but Sejanus refuses to give in. That's when his friend reveals that he's secretly been helping a group of locals who are planning to escape out of the district, but while he's distracted, Snow activates a device that records the entire conversation and sends it off to the head game maker as evidence of his treason. It's a cutthroat move, but he's willing to stab his only friend in the back so that he won't ruin his chances of returning to his own family back at the capital. That night, they return to the bar, but Snow and Lucy Gray catch Sejanus in one of the back rooms, having a secret meeting with the rebels. They'd originally promised Sejanus that their plans were peaceful, but now the three of them see that they've been stockpiling weapons all along, and this idiot Billy let his girlfriend Mayfair, the mayor's daughter, find out about the whole thing. Mayfair decides that she's going to snitch on them all, but Snow here can't let that happen, and before anyone can even react, he picks up a rifle and shoots the girl in the back, killing her. Billy here starts freaking out and charges Snow, but the rebel leader Spruce blasts him with his shotgun, and now they've got two dead bodies on their hands. Lucy Gray and Sejanus are horrified, but Snow and Spruce quickly hide the weapons and tell them that they need to play it cool so that nobody finds out what they've done. Okay, man, saying that things just took a turn for the worse here would be the understatement of the century. Not only are they wrapped up in a rebel conspiracy, but they've just killed the mayor's daughter and her boyfriend, and if the peacekeepers find out, they'll all be dead the very next morning. This puts Snow here in an impossibly tough position. To me, it looks like the only way for him to get the good ending at this point is to admit to Sejanus what he's done, and hope that his friend forgives him because he really has no other choice. They need to kill Spruce, and try to make it look like there was a scuffle between him and the other two victims. With any luck, the authorities might believe that it was a fight among the rebels, and consider it a closed case. With the mayor's own daughter being one of the victims though, there's a good chance that the peacekeepers aren't going to be satisfied unless they get revenge. Even after framing Spruce, they'll probably still round up anyone who they suspect is remotely involved in the rebel plans for execution. So it might be the case that their only option is to get the hell out of town right away and never look back. Snow, Sejanus, and Lucy Gray should grab whatever weapons and supplies they can, join up with the rest of her convoy, and disappear into the wilderness before sunrise the next day. This would mean that he'll never return to the capital or see his family again, but it's better than being hanged for treason. Unfortunately for everyone else though, Snow here is about to show his true colors. In the morning, the peacekeepers launch a massive search to find out who's responsible, turning the entire district upside down in their search for the weapons. Lucy Gray calls out to Snow from an alleyway, saying that she needs to get out of town before she's caught, but Snow promises that he's going to come with her, and they agree to meet at the hanging tree first thing tomorrow. The peacekeepers end up catching Spruce, but before he's about to be hanged for his crimes, they bring up Sejanus too, having 
learned of his involvement thanks to Snow's secret recording, and all he can do is watch as his only friend is executed in front of the crowd. The next morning, Snow sneaks off base to meet Lucy Gray at the hanging tree, and the two of them set off back towards her secret cabin far out in the woods. It starts to rain, so they take shelter in the cabin, where Snow finds the murder weapons hidden under the floorboards. Thinking it over, he realizes that if he destroys the gun, then all of the evidence is gone, and he can safely return home, leaving Lucy Gray herself as the only loose end. She can tell what he's thinking, and after a tense moment, she leaves the cabin saying that she's going to gather some roots from the forest, but it's the last time that they'll ever see each other ever again. When Snow goes to ditch the weapon in the lake, he realizes that Lucy Gray is nowhere in sight. Worried, he finds part of her clothes in the woods nearby, but she's hidden a snake underneath that bites him on the arm when he gets closer. Now, Snow here is furious, and that's when he spots her running between the trees a short distance away. He fires a single shot at her with his rifle and falls to the ground, but when he gets there, she's already gone, having disappeared without a trace into the wilderness. When he gets back to base, Snow finds that there's been another change of plans. Instead of sending him to officer training, he's been summoned back to the capital for a meeting with the head game maker herself. She tells him that he's been given full pardon by the president and is going to receive a full scholarship to the university paid by Sejanus' father as a way to repay him for being such a good friend to his son. Not only that, but the games are coming back for another year now that the citizens of the capital are interested again thanks to his ideas. Now Snow says that he's finally learned the true purpose of the games. They're to remind everyone that the whole world is nothing but a fight to the death, and that the only thing that matters is coming out on top no matter who you have to sacrifice to get there. With the prize money, he's able to buy back his family's home and set them up to live a life of luxury once again. But there's one last person who he needs to pay a visit. Snow goes back to the academy and finds the Dean passed out at his desk after drinking himself silly. That's when the Dean reveals how the Hunger Games originally came to be. Many years ago, while he was in the Academy, he and his partner, Snow's father, were given an assignment to come up with a punishment for the districts so brutal that they'd never revolt again. He came up with the idea for the games while blackout drunk, and although when he sobered up he realized how awful it was, Snow's father stole the idea and followed through with it. As Snow leaves, the Dean drinks a vial full of rat poison that he left behind finally putting himself out of his misery. Outside, Snow triumphantly stands in the courtyard in front of the statue of Lady Justice, ready to embrace his destiny as the future president of Pan Am. Holy sh that was crazy. Hunger Games, pre-Hunger Games. It's been going on for a while. If I were in that situation, I would do everything that I could, friendship be damned, to get the hell out of there and live a happy life, right? I'm not there to make friends, I'm there to survive. But what would you guys do? Let me know down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Shout out to our wonderful writer and our excellent editing team for making this show possible. You guys kick ass. And thanks to you guys, the audience, for taking the time to make it through this entire video. As you can imagine, these videos take a, a considerable amount of time to put together, so making it all the way to the end here means a whole lot to us. Thank you so much. Oh yeah, and if you enjoyed this video, share it with a friend, you know? The more the merrier. We love you guys here on How To Beat. And be sure to check out the How To Beat playlist for more videos just like this one. Leave a like and subscribe, and uh, we'll see you guys on the next video. Have a damn good day.